Well, what an extraordinary week it's been. Uh, on the very first morning uh, of the dawn after the great referendum on Britain's membership of the EU, I gave a broadcast on my own roof, as I recall, in which I urged the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, remember him, uh, he scuttled at about 10 o'clock that morning, but I wasn't to know that at five or six o'clock in the morning. I asked him to call Jeremy Corbyn in as part of a national unity negotiating team to negotiate our way out of the European Union. I, as well as Corbyn, called that first day for Article 50 to be immediately triggered. Not many people now remember that. And if we had done that, we wouldn't now be in the mess that we are in. In fact, both of the main political parties in the state would not be in the mess that they are now in. What do I mean mess? Well, you heard uh, Professor Sir John Curtis say in the studio last Friday that whereas the main two, the old firm, Tory and Labour, had been just a couple of months ago, neck in neck, both of them just over 40% in the national opinion polls, they were now still neck and neck, but both of them were in the low 30s in the national opinion polls. There was a by-election yesterday in Newport West. Labour fielded a Euro-fanatic candidate and one historically not all that keen on Jeremy Corbyn either. The poll was 37% Labour halved its majority. Uh, it scraped home with around 1,700 votes of a majority. UKIP nearly tripled its vote. The Conservatives came a close second in the South Wales Valley. And, of course, we're not short of electoral tests for the two main political parties over the next few weeks. There are the local elections at the beginning of May. There are, 80% likely, in my view, the European Parliament elections on the 23rd of May. And, full disclosure, I intend to run in those elections if they happen. And there's the small matter of, surely, an upcoming parliamentary by-election in the constituency of Peterborough. Because the miscreant MP for Peterborough can no longer be allowed to abuse her, her position as a convicted liar cheat, someone who wasted the police and the court's time, someone who went through not one but two trials at very great public expense only to be exposed as an inveterate liar, notwithstanding she was a lawyer and an MP, or perhaps that should have been what they call in the intelligence community a clue. The MP for Peterborough is currently going through the process of recall. Her constituents are voting on whether they want her to stand down and face the electorate again if she dares in a parliamentary by-election. I'm no Nostradamus, but my feeling is she'll lose that one and that there will be the mother of all parliamentary by-elections in the Peterborough constituency, and it will most probably be on the same day as the European Parliament elections on the 23rd of May. Just to bury bad news, if you get my drift. Because the situation we are now in has burst open the dam. It has burst open the dam that we have lived under for uh, all of our lives, where the two big parties were a king and queen. They sometimes alternated. There were sometimes rebels at the gates, but the hegemony of the duopoly, the two-party system, two big tents with all kinds of ideologies uh, coexisting more or less harmoniously inside those tents is now, I believe, on the point of breaking apart and permanently. I say that for a lot of reasons. I say it partly because the uh, Brexit experience as lived, the lived reality, 
of the 17.4 million people and more, I'd argue, in Britain who have seen their very clear one and a half million majority decision systematically, and I stress that word systematically, undermined, subverted, sabotaged, wrecked by a British Parliament stuffed full of professional politicians who just can't bear the fact that the people didn't take their advice, voted against the script. And there are signs in the last week that there is a rapid change now beginning to take place. I refer you to the Sky News polling, very extensive polling, out this evening, which shows that leaving right now without a deal is now the most popular political option in Britain. More people in Britain want to leave the EU right now with no deal than any other option. In fact, by quite a considerable margin. And Theresa May's Brexit in name only, which would become Brexit in even less uh, name only if she has a lash up with Jeremy Corbyn, to which I will turn in a minute. It will be even less of a Brexit if it's uh, negotiated with Jeremy Corbyn. That's trailing in at just 16%. This is in one week. In two weeks, the last two weeks, support for remaining in the European Union in the current impasse has fallen by nine points, nine percentage points. And support for leaving right now with no deal has risen by nine points. No gains for the don't knows or couldn't care less. Nine points off remain, nine points off a WTO Brexit. Now, I think that politics has begun to move at a rapid pace, very rapid. I believe it's in advance of the politicians at Westminster. It's well in advance of the correspondents at Westminster, neither of whom have their finger on the pulse of the people because they live in the Westminster bubble where which unrepresentative politician whispered in your ear last is the person whose ideas and views, perspectives makes it on to the news, makes it in to the news papers. But in the Northwest, where I'll be standing, where I spend a lot of time in Manchester and Liverpool, that's not the reality on the ground. People are as mad as hell about what's going on. They couldn't be more angry about the pitiful, utterly pitiful performance of the parliamentarians. I happen to believe that Jeremy Corbyn has fought a skilled and principled rearguard action against the Blairite fifth column sitting all around him, some of them sitting in his shadow cabinet itself, four years into the Corbyn Labour leadership. I believe that Corbyn has sought to resist the madness of a second referendum on a subject when the result of the first referendum hasn't even been implemented. I believe that Corbyn, guided by the ideas of Mr Tony Benn, about whom much more later, guided by his own experience in Parliament with me as an opponent of the Maastricht Treaty, of the Lisbon Treaty, of the Nice Treaty, as an opponent of the single market, as an opponent of the customs union, as an opponent of all the paraphernalia of the European Union, found himself the leader of the Labour Party and a prisoner of the likes of Emily Thornberry and Sir Keir Starmer. He should have seen that coming. But this week, Emily Thornberry, the shadow foreign secretary, actually sent a letter, an open letter, contradicting her own leader in whose shadow cabinet she holds such an eminent position, daring, challenging Corbyn's 
interpretation of the Labour Party conference resolution, as did Tom Watson, but I'm not going to waste breath on him because everybody out there knows that if Corbyn said today was Friday, Watson would insist that it was Saturday. Watson has only one goal, to see Jeremy Corbyn turfed out of office and replaced by someone like himself. But Thornbury is a different kettle of fish. Her false, wrong interpretation of the Labour Party's conference resolution on Brexit was a direct challenge to the Labour leader, following on from the direct challenge issued by Tom Watson just a few weeks ago. Corbyn, I think, is trying his best to avoid what would be an unmitigated disaster, not just for this country, but for the Labour Party itself. Because I promise you this, if they cheat the 17.4 million Brexit voters, the winners of the last referendum, by forcing them into a second referendum in which implicitly Labour is campaigning to remain in the EU and undo the result of the first referendum, Labour will be destroyed in huge swathes of the country, in South Wales, in the South West, in the coastal towns and villages, in the Midlands, in the North West, in the North East, in the urban dereliction that Britain has become over the last 40 years of Thatcherite economics under the banner of European Union neoliberal austerity. Labour will be destroyed, and Corbyn ought not, and I'm sure not, want to enter the history books as the man that brought about the permanent demise of the party to which he has given so much. So, if I'm right, it's going to be a rocky few months. Now, I said 80% earlier. There's a 20%. There's a 20% possibility that Corbyn and May will lash up a brino minus and that that will go through the House of Commons in time to go to the European Union summit on Wednesday and that the longer extension will not be necessary, the European Parliament elections will not be fought, but that will only postpone this crisis of which I speak. Because a Brexit which isn't a Brexit is going to look, feel and smell like a Brexit that isn't a Brexit. And those political forces now gathering strength on the right of British politics, English nationalism, British nationalism, even farther right than that, will still have their cause, will still be able to claim that Britain has been stabbed in the back, the age-old cry of those who seek to take us down the rabbit hole of fascism, of extreme nationalism. That's why I'm standing in the elections if they come, because I will not allow the Brexit issue to become the prerogative, to become the province of the far right in British politics. As I said in the week, if I'm elected to the European Parliament, Herr Juncker, Mr Barnier and the rest will have to develop bigger ears because they're going to be hearing plenty from me. New frontier of free speech. That's why this guy gets in every single week with all his texts. He's always, of course, anonymous, but his number is always the same. And the text reads, Corbyn voted to stay in the EU, you moron. And all the polls I've seen, support for Remain has risen. Hope you do stand in elections, because you'll get Hammered. Actually, I refer to the Sky News poll this very afternoon, which contradicts uh, the Honourable 
gentlemen. We've got Nigel Farage uh, on the show in the second hour. We'll also be talking about the knife crime epidemic with Leroy Logan, MBE, former police superintendent. We'll be talking about the really vexed issue of the addiction of our young people and not just our young people, who am I to speak, uh, to the screen uh, with Amy Orban, who is the author of a controversial study, a surprising study uh, on that subject. We'll be talking to Ahmed Caballo, a journalist uh, of note and who's really uh, going places. And he's just been six weeks in Venezuela. We'll be talking to him and we'll be talking to Andy Barrett, the writer of Tony Benn's Last Tape, which is a wonderful play that I attended last night at the Clapham Omnibus Theatre, and it's there until the 20th of April. It is a beautiful one-man play. Uh, just uh, the man playing, Mr. Ben, is on the stage. It's set in his almost exact replica of his study uh, in the house that he lived in, uh, more or less all of his long and beautiful married life, had all his children there, brought all his children up there and died uh, in that house or at least in the hospital coming out of that house. It's perfectly, perfectly represented. And the writer of the play, Andy Barrett, has done a wonderful job capturing the spirit, the mannerisms and the words uh, of the late and great uh, Tony Benn. There's even a message on the European Union in the play. Uh, Phil Jones in Doncaster says, George, so looking forward to tonight's show. My missus is doing the big shop in Sainsbury's and I'm sat in a car in the car park waiting with bated breath. Thanks for that, Phil. Um, she's in Sainsbury's, so that probably means you're not in Waitrose. I don't know if Doncaster has a Waitrose, but I'm going to infer that on political uh, issues you are with me. The best to you and to your missus. And uh, this one from Tony. Mrs. May doesn't want to leave. She's doing all she can to delay change, to delay or change the outcome of Brexit. Remember, at the same time, she's got to look like she's doing all she can to leave. Otherwise, she will damage her party and democracy for years to come. Thanks, Tony. Uh, good evening, George. An important takeaway from the betrayal of Brexit. The TUC leadership cravenly supported Remain. Hence, we were always dependent on the weaker side of a fissure in the ranks of the ruling class to push Brexit through. If that weaker section lost, we lacked an organised working class to push Brexit through. Even if Brexit were realised, its shape would be moulded by the most powerful people in the country whose interests are antagonistic to those of our own class. The lesson is that voting is never enough if the working class is otherwise inert. This will remain true should Jeremy Corbyn become Prime Minister. That's from uh, the University Dawn, Samson in Kilmarnock. Now, Mike Indian writes for the Groucho Tendency, and he's on the line now, Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joe. Now, uh, day three of uh, the Corbyn-May negotiations. Never thought we'd be saying that a week or so ago. Uh, <laughs> day three of uh, the intensive negotiations uh, between the Labour leader, who was uh, only days ago a Marxist, Russian spy, friend of terrorists, anti-Semite, and all the other anti-national uh, insults they could hurl at him. Now they seem to need him and he's ensconced with the Tories trying to get them out of the hole that they've dug themselves in. How do you see these talks going, Mike? I see them going nowhere at the moment, George, unless the Prime Minister can move on the next question of the Customs Union. But it's a big coup for Jeremy Corbyn. He's been invited in there today and a vindication of his strategy, I think, of maintaining a certain degree of ambiguity around Labour's Brexit position as well. But as of today, we haven't seen any movement coming out of the Cabinet Office talks. Uh, where are they actually meeting? In the Cabinet Office? I'm guessing they are. The first set of talks were held in Parliament in the Prime Minister's office. The second set were held in Parliament again yesterday. That was with David Liddington. So if Liddington is in the room, he's made de facto deputy. It shows the government is taking it seriously. But, we've but they didn't want the Parliament. optics of Jeremy walking into number 10 Downing Street, did they? <laughs> 
there was a time that many people would have said Jeremy wouldn't have wanted that, those optics himself. But he is the leader of the opposition. And this I've been at that door thing. hundreds of times with Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> handing in petitions, uh, raising our fist at the Prime Minister inside. Absolutely, but he's been walking down that street now as the Prime Minister in waiting. And that, again, as you said, an election could be coming in the coming weeks or months, George. It's not an optic that the government wanted to have here. But also don't forget now that the Prime Minister herself isn't in the room for these talks. She's farmed it out to David Livingston because, as ever, she's, she's written to David of the European Council to request the extension. But the longer these talks go on, the more both leaders can gain out of it. But the country loses out because we don't yet have a solution to re- resolve the Brexit impasse. And the European Union, uh, some of them are getting a bit, uh, a bit uh, hot under the collar, uh, beginning to chafe over it all, uh, particularly President Macron of France. And, of course, only needs one of them, just one out of 27, uh, to say, actually, we've had enough uh, of this, no more extensions. And that's it, done. Quite right, George. And actually, we mustn't have missed out this week that Leah Varadkar, the Taoiseach, is in touring both France and Germany, holding press conferences with Angela Merkel and President Macron. Strong shows of support there in solidarity with Ireland over the vexed question of the border here. But I don't think we're going to see a veto from any of the EU27 next week for the extension, not least of all because what Donald Tusk is reportedly proposing to them, which is his one-year extension, if we have to call it that, is really in the interest of all parties, and it puts the onus back on Britain to resolve that crisis. It gives us the breathing room to try and pass the Prime Minister's deal because that plus a customs union looks to be the only viable option that gets through the House of Commons. So you don't think that the 30th of June will be accepted by the Commission, that they will insist on uh, on a whole year? I think they'll insist on a whole year, but sooner if we can get the withdrawal agreement passed. And don't forget that many of Mrs May's own MPs want her gone sooner than that as well. And for Labour, they want to move past the withdrawal group because what they really have to put the case on is what kind of future relationship, what kind of Brexit are we going to have after the terms of divorce are agreed to. We spend enough time talking about the backstop, EU citizens' rights and the, the divorce payment. What really has to be decided now is what happens after we formally leave the EU, whether it's next Friday, whether it's at the end of 2021, or whether it's even longer than that. And I believe Jeremy Corbyn has something he wishes to say about that. But first, we have to help the Prime Minister get the withdrawal agreement through the Commons so she can get out of the way so she can deal with her successor. I said 8020 will be participating in the European Parliament elections. What's your estimate of it? I, I probably agree with you on those numbers there, George. I mean, you mentioned Nigel Farage, that he's already somewhat begrudgingly declared his candidacy as well. And it really is going to be an absolutely fascinating turn for events that if we are participating. It would be a gut wrench, I think, for many people if we had to spend millions of pounds. It costs 100, million 110 pounds. million it costs to hold them. It was, and just 40 million of that was just spent on postage five years ago as well. If you were telling people that three years on from the referendum we'd be preparing to, to participate to send MEPs back to Brussels and Strasbourg, they wouldn't have believed it. It's no, it, uh, it, it's uh, pretty damning, as I heard Nigel Evans say uh, on the news, it's a pretty damning indictment on the uh, the Parliament that we have, the system that we have. I mean, I don't think uh, it's helped by the uh, Lilliputian character of most of the members, uh, but the system uh, doesn't work, does it? I mean, we have uh, in the week... Uh, a, 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 a convict on licence with an electronic tag uh, walking through one lobby, a Conservative MP walking through the opposite lobby, even though he's pled guilty to charges of expenses fraud and is awaiting sentence. Uh, we have a vote going through 313 to 312, uh, going through in four hours, a bill going through the House of Commons in four hours, and then on to the unelected House of Lords. It's it's all really, uh, uh, I don't know, Ruritarian, Heath Robinson, call it what you like, but it doesn't look like a modern parliament. It doesn't look good. But let's address Fiona on the Sanya directly here. The MP has been convicted in a court of lying about a speeding offence. She's currently served a short time of her sentence and she's subject to a recall petition. Now, for her to be the effective casting vote that sent the uh, Yvette Cooper bill to the House of Lords, which would bind the Prime Minister's hands on seeking an extension, does not look good for those people, like your first text that you read out, who are advocating for Remain. Let's bring it back to the European elections again for a second here. The government, the reason the government really doesn't want 
to have any sort of participation in the election besides the optics is that it could manifest a massive outcry from those people who might wish to remain inside the EU as well. If, for example, parties like the Liberal Democrats maybe Change UK, fared well in those elections because they could do under the PR system that employs. Yes, although the Liberal Democrats lost their deposit in the Newport West by-election yesterday. So uh, even though uh, the um, centrist uh, Remain position still has, of course, a lot of uh, support. Millions of people uh, would like to remain in the European Union. The Liberal Democrats, who are the purest incarnation of that, they lost their deposit. Let's be clear, George. We haven't seen a massive swell of opinion, any evidence of this. But some polls do suggest that Remain has edged ahead, but that could be due to demographic shifts as well. If we look at most opinion polling relating to staying or leaving the EU, even on a second referendum, the country is mostly evenly split. There's maybe a percentage or two either way. And as John Curtis, the available polling is constantly behind us. Nobody has consistently asked the same question. So there is very little evidence you could draw from poll to poll. And by-elections, whilst they're fascinating events of Politico, often don't show accurate barometers of public opinion. What I would be keen to see is if a by-election happens in Peterborough, and I think it should happen, given the recall process and um, the fact Fiona Arnold has refused to stand down, that's a swing seat in a leave area, only a 600 majority that might give us a better idea of what's actually happening regarding Brexit. But everyone's ratings are down at the moment. Jeremy Corbyn's favourable late ratings are lower than Theresa May, and Labour are still behind the Tories in most opinion polls. So if, even if there is an election coming, the Labour Party still has a lot of ground to make of it, in spite of the almighty mess the Conservative Party has found itself in over the last year or so. Mike Indian of the Groucho Tendency, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, never in my life did I imagine that I'd be able to say the following words. I'm joined now by the broadcasting legend, John Motson. John, good evening. Hello, George. How are you, mate? I'm wonderful uh, now that I'm speaking to you, and I'm coming to your uh, event at the Greenwood Theatre. Our sister station, Talk Sport, of course, for whom you yes. work, uh, is putting the legend that is John Motson live onto the stage at the Greenwood wow. Theatre. That's King's College, London, on Monday, April 15th. I've got my tickets. You'll be joining Paul Hawksby there, one of the great gurus of broadcasting. John, uh, have you been doing any rehearsal or does it all just well, come naturally? George, I've been I've been following you on Brexit, mate. I mean, have you sorted this out yet? Well, uh, if they'll give me the uh, job, I'll sort it out in, in 48 hours. But unfortunately, sure it's, it's lesser sure men would. and women that are doing it. <laughs> Listen, yes, I'm, I'm I'm doing this thing in the theatre, George. Um, it's just kind of a sort of a trial in a way. It's a pilot because we we hope to take this to theatres around the country, and I I couldn't be doing it any better, um, obviously, with, than with Paul Hawksby. But it, it's going to be a kind of question and answer and a bit of fun, and maybe I'll tell two stories. Two or three stories, George, that I couldn't tell when I was working at the BBC. Who knows? <laughs> well, I'm Listen, looking mate, forward. I'm, uh, I'm, look I'm really flattered that you're coming, George. Oh, no, definitely. I'm, I've been your fan, well, for the best part of 50 years. Uh, I mean, oh, wow. uh, I, you're you're slightly older than me, but I, I've since you burst on the scene and became a legend, uh, I've been listening to your voice, marvelling at your commentary, uh, lamenting when you left the BBC and rejoicing when you came to us uh, on, on Talk yeah. Sport, their loss, our, uh, our gain. In that 50 years, John, what would, be the, what would be the biggest changes on and off the field in the game? Good. Good would, question. You Great saw? question. Great question, George. I would say, uh, it, it, we haven't got a lot of time to debate this, but I would say the commercial side of the game mainly. Yeah. When I started, there were no restaurants in clubs. There were no sponsors. There was no names on shirts. There were no numbers on the back beyond 11. I mean, the game was a very, what can I say? In those days, George, it was down. You were there then. Yeah, it was, it was a working down class, earth, a working class game. Earth, working class, absolutely. Um, I mean, you'd run um, into the players that yeah, you idolised. Yeah. You'd run into them walk, sometimes on the walk. bus. George, I used to walk down the corridor and see the players before the game. And I tell you what, there was no security then like there is now. And do you know something? A guy who's in the news at the moment, Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer, and people say to me, do you know him? And I say, well, 
I met him once a long time ago. And I tell you what, George, the day that Manchester United played at Leeds, when Oli Gunnar Solskjaer made one of his early appearances, I was down in the tunnel. I wouldn't be allowed there now. And, and I said to him, Mr. Solskjaer, how do I pronounce your name? And he said to me, Oli Gunnar said to me, he said, don't worry about trying to persuade to, to pronounce it in Norwegian. He said, you'll never get near it. And I said, well, I was, I was going to call you Solskjaer. And he said, well, listen, call me Solskjaer. And wow. I said, well, we've done it ever since. Yeah, well, that, that's uh, now the national title. Uh, all yeah. is all is uh, at the wheel. I'm speaking at Manchester myself, actually, on Saturday night, and that's my that's are, my yeah. that's my slogan. Uh, George Galloway's at I the wheel are, yeah. in Manchester. Yeah, I know you are. I'll tell you yeah. what else has changed fantastically. Uh, Go on. We used to wait with bated breath for Saturday nights highlights of football <laughs> one yeah, know, one on yeah. bbc and then you'd flick over to itv they were helpfully not on at the same time and so you might get different games uh, different commentators uh, yeah. now i myself watch football virtually every night and then do, you can George, watch yeah. ours on either oh. side of the game i know well george i think you made a great point here i think I have to, I'll be careful what I say because it's my profession and all that. I have to think there's a bit of an overkill here. I do believe we've got to just channel our thoughts a little bit about how often we watch a match. You could sit here from Sunday to Sunday and you could watch a, a match every night of the week. And I just think the whole danger for football, the risk, if you like, of our great game is a little bit of overkill. And my own view is... The rarity value of having a live game has actually disappeared. And I would just say we've got to be very careful with it because you know and I know that the things we've been involved with, you know, you can get to the point where you've had too much of it. And I, I never want football to get to that point, George. It's a very good point, actually, because uh, although that, that I never would, uh, because, you know, I'd watch two te two pub teams playing and I'd listen to their managers after the game. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But but there may be, there may be for a part of the audience, a danger of that uh, overkill. Mm. Yeah, I think there might be. I mean, you've been in politics and every other walk of life. And I think sometimes, you know, you, you can have a bit too much of everything. Yeah, 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 you know, definitely. I mean, yeah, George, yeah. you know better than me. I mean, I've... Listen, I, I'm a mere football commentator. I'm trying to follow Brexit at the moment, and I'm not trying to draw you into this uh, on okay. your own I've show. got Nigel Farage just, coming up after I, you. Well, I was going to say, ask, no, I just think every night I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I'm getting more and more confused, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking, well, this is, is not what... Actually, to be honest, I'll be, I can say this now, I'm not at the BBC, I voted to remain, but... But when the other the vote went the other way, I thought, OK, that's what the country wants. We don't want the customs union. We don't want the single market. We're going to channel immigration. We're going to get our own laws back. And they were the four issues I thought people voted on. Not me, but the people, obviously, the... The majority, the yeah. 52, 48 thing we all know about. Now, listen, all of a sudden now, it's going back the other way. You know, Theresa May's talking to Jeremy Corbyn about the single market. Well, hold on a minute. That's why we came out, wasn't it, George? <laughs> exactly. So, for a for a mere football commentator, you've got that yes. bang. You've got that oh, bang wow. on the money. Now, <laughs> now, how many have you? Any? Is there any point in me plugging this? Are there tickets still available? Yes. I think you should plug this because, well, to be fair to Paul Hawksby, He's been plugging it, yeah. programming. Uh, and, and we're going to the Greenwood Theatre a week on Monday night near London Bridge, which is where, of course, Talk Sport is based now. Yep. And Talk Radio will be, won't yep. it? Very, and I just think it, it, it's a bit of a pilot, George. I mean, it's a great. I, I, work, I'm sure it will well. tour the whole country. I'm sure it will. Well, because that's our uh, plan. We, look, we, that's our plan. John, we don't have uh, many national treasures. There's no, not many. Well, I, I went to see Mr. Ben, the play about Mr. Ben last <laughs> night. There was yeah, a yeah. national treasure yeah. that people would go to see him in a theatre from Land's End to John O'Groats, whether they agreed with him or not. Uh, you are a national treasure and you're still alive and kicking. And so <laughs> people would be fools not to go. 
Thank you, George. I, I mean the compliment. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know how this is going to work out. We're going to have a go at it. And, and if I'm, I'm quite certain that Paul will be a terrific uh, He'll be a great host. host. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he will be. I, I'm just looking forward and thinking, well, if this works and we can take it to theatres in the provincial cities or wherever it may be, uh, well, great. I mean, I, I never take anything for granted. You've said some very kind things. I think maybe my career, well, a lot of it is over now because I did 50 years at the BBC and all that's behind me. But if I can make a contribution and have some fun with some audiences up and down the country, that would be fantastic. And I'm I'm so thrilled you've rung me tonight because I wasn't expecting this. Nobody, nobody warned me, but it's... Bald. No, no, they, they gave me, they gave me a readout and I said, never mind a readout, <laughs> let's talk to John. Well, you were right, and I'm down in Bournemouth with some friends, and I'm having a nice weekend, and I'm going Good. to the game against Burnley tomorrow, and I'm thrilled that you come into the London Bridge thing, because I'm going to see you there, George. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. The legend, that is John Motson. He's on at the Greenwood Theatre, that's at King's College London, on Monday, April the 15th, hosted by Paul Hawksby, and of course staged by our own... Talk Sports, Paul Hawksby. Not everyone likes me, of course. Simon in the New Forest says, I used to think you were bonkers. Now I'm convinced you are bat crazy. You make a lot of noise, but very little substance. Thank God you're only on once a week. Brackets. Too much. And Jimmy says, great to hear John Motson. I prefer it when football was BBC and ITV with Barry Davis, Alan Parry and the late great Brian Moore and the FA Cup final being at 3pm kickoff on Grandstand or World of Sport. And they call me a nostalgist, Jimmy. And David says, Parliament has become so arrogant and ignorant and unaware of why they are there. They fail to understand that the people are the country, and they have decimated their own parties in the process. They're not fit for purpose. Now, my good friend Tamar Asfahani is down at the Ecuador Embassy. Why, you might think. Well, my long-standing friend, Julian Assange, may very well be about to be turfed out onto the streets of London, but only momentarily, because... He would then be promptly arrested by the British police that are waiting for him there. And the United States uh, has already submitted a request for his extradition to face secret trial in the United States on an indictment not yet made public following a grand jury uh, whose membership and conclusions are again secret. But one thing's for sure. Julian Assange and his supporters will not go quietly into that good night. Tamar, uh, tell me it isn't so. He hasn't been seized yet. No, not yet, George. Uh, we are outside the Ecuadorian embassy. There is a group of people here that are holding a vigil for him in the hope that... Uh, Nothing will happen. There are rumours, of course, that, uh, and there has been since this morning, uh, that he will be turfed out at some point today. Um, then those rumours turn into days, and now we're hearing on the street from people, some are saying that these uh, rumours are now not going to happen until next week. We're obviously here uh, with, the, uh, with the people outside of the, the embassy, and we spoke to a couple of them earlier. Um, they're not very happy. They feel that some of the uh, conditions that, and you can probably hear him hear them now, yes. um, the conditions in which that he is uh, being kept in are inhumane and in contradictory of the Human Rights Convention. Uh, so there is a whole other thing going on here. Now, whether or not that's true, we can't make any claims or make any uh, suggestions on how he's being held. All we know that he's is that he is still inside the Ecuadorian embassy uh, with people here that are still supporting him, primarily from Chile, which is quite interesting. Uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. And there's uh, an Irish uh, man, an Irish-American man from the Catholic Workers uh, organization that is literally sleeping on the pavement outside uh, because I frequently go by to shout to Julian Assange through the window. Sometimes I even sing him a song because he likes my singing voice. Um, Does he I, know? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, do you see a lot of uh, armed police around? That would be a clue, as we say in the intelligence community. 
No, there hasn't been armed police around, but there has been, especially in the last sort of 20 minutes, there's been one police car that's been kind of doing the circuits, coming here every two, three minutes. Uh, there has been some police presence. Uh, the crowds aren't huge, so there, there's no need for any kind of crowd control. Um, but there is... There is a there is a definite under kind of stated police presence, and of course because we are right behind Harrods, it's one of the most kind of uh, tourist one of the biggest tourist attractions here in West London. Yes, so to be so to close be to the Harrods of. food hall for seven long years and not be able to uh, visit it—that's uh, just one no, of absolutely. the minor inconveniences of Julian Assange's life. In the Evening Standard today, it says uh, that the police have commandeered or rented actually uh, an apartment right opposite the uh, the embassy uh, so they can uh, monitor everyone who comes and goes so uh, wave hello to them for me please I am now uh, I'm Tama. looking uh, <laughs> I'm looking at the uh, oh uh, obviously the other problem with it being Knightsbridge is the amount of ridiculous cars that are that are yes. kicking around yes. but yes I am waving uh, at these blackened windows okay. uh, above there is there is one apartment with windows open so I'm not sure if that's them but we'll wave at all of them hi 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 Tama, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm glad we sent you on a, a safer billet than the one you were on last week uh, on the uh, Brexit march. Uh, go safe, though, and get back to the studio safely. Now, no one could deny that Nigel Farage is the mother of all members of the European Parliament. In fact, he's practically the only one any of you have ever heard of. Now, I told you earlier, I'll be standing for the European Parliament. He announced today that he will lead his new party, the Brexit Party, into those elections. Nigel, I'm not sure how they'll cope in the European Parliament if both of us get back, but let's start uh, <laughs> let, let's start with uh, how we got here. The only reason that we can stand in the European Parliament elections is because uh, the mother of all rearguard actions has been fought by those who didn't accept the results of the referendum. No, I mean, it's a complete failure of leadership in our country, and that goes for Theresa May and her government, who never had the courage of doing the job properly. And when she said no deal is better than a bad deal, which, if you think about it, is one of the most obvious statements in human history, uh, she never actually meant it. And a parliament staffed in both parties full of establishment corporatist Remainers who, as you say, never accepted the result. It is a willful betrayal of the greatest democratic exercise in the history of this country. And I, I have to say, I've never known in my life, certainly, the gap between the political class and ordinary people to be deeper, wider and more fundamental than it is right today. Well, I, I made these points earlier, and I think they're still underestimated, so speak to them, please. There's a rapid transformation going on. If you look at the polls, as I do uh, assiduously, even in just the last week, there has been a dramatic shift. The most popular choice now in Britain is to leave right now without a deal. Yes, I mean, you're quite right. I mean, over the last few weeks, we've seen a massive shift. Um, and now, every single region in Wales and England, with the exception of London, leaving with no deal immediately commands a huge lead over remaining. I want to say a huge lead. You know, I'm not talking 4 or 5% like the referendum. I'm talking 15, 16% in the Midlands and areas like that. Uh, and yes, people, not just leavers, interestingly, a significant number of Remainers are saying we have to leave with no deal. We have to honour the referendum result. We are supposed to be a democratic country. And if we don't carry out the will of the people, we'll never be the same place again. So, yeah, it is a very dramatic shift. And, you know, I've spoken over the last week to several members of Parliament on both sides of the, of the divide, and neither of them were actually aware of what was really going on in the country. I find that astonishing. Yes, uh, they're in the Westminster bubble. They rarely meet anyone other than those in a, a deferential relationship to themselves, people at their surgeries and so on. They actually don't uh, feel the pulse of public opinion in the country. I'm now utterly convinced uh, of that. It's been happening for a while. But we now have a, a, a political class, a parliament, which smells of the kind of sewage that was leaking in the public gallery this week. 
uh, I don't. I haven't known a time when when uh, the British political class was held in in, in lower order. No, quite right. In fact, contempt, I think. Total and utter contempt is what is being felt out there in the country. Um, and I, there's, there's, there's one good thing that happened today, and that is this. An extension is far better than accepting Mrs. May's new European treaty. It gives us a chance as a country to press the reset button, but it also gives a chance to the one group of people who've been totally ignored for the last two or three years to say something, and you've all got a chance, listeners, to go out and vote in those European elections. And I, I genuinely believe there is an opportunity here to deliver the body politic a shock like they've never had before. Now, the lash-up that uh, is underway, uh, the, you might say the, the Corbyn, Theresa May uh, lash-up, we never thought we'd be saying those words, uh, is that going to come to anything? Will they reach agreement, do you think? No, I don't. Um, I, it, it's pretty clear that uh, Keir Starmer, on behalf of the Labour Party, now wants what they call a confirmatory referendum. And that referendum would be a choice between Mrs May's appalling treaty or staying in the current European treaties. It wouldn't even give Leave voters the chance to express an opinion. And whatever damage Mrs May has done, to the Conservative Party and their vote in the country. Believe me, she could never, ever agree to that. And I think it's actually, to be honest with you, in Labour's interests now uh, for there not to be any form um, of, 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 of deal, treaty going through Parliament uh, and to see the Conservatives suffer at the ballot box. Having said that, I, I think Labour perhaps underestimate what could happen to their vote because, do you know, the five million people who voted Brexit out there, who then voted for Jeremy Corbyn in that 2017 election. And there is this, this mythology that goes on through the media that somehow Brexit is a right-wing ideology. You know, far from it, actually, uh, the people like Tony Benn were the great leaders of the Eurosceptic movement for decades in this country. So Labour may be complacent, but I think they could get hurt badly too. Now, uh, the European Parliament elections, 23rd of May, uh, I think you think, like me, that uh, an 80% chance of them uh, going ahead. Mm -hmm. There are local elections at the beginning. There was a by-election in Newport West uh, just yesterday. There's the potential for a parliamentary by-election in, in a very strong Remain seat in Peterborough. Uh, because there's a recall petition going on there. There's lots of opportunities for the public to pass judgment on these politicians. Yes, there is. Um, but the difference being uh, that you've got a series of local results where many, many other issues will come into play. And when it comes to a European election, there's no doubt about one thing. It'll be about the European question, and it will be a national contest in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. So as far as the Brexit party is concerned, which I've just taken leadership of, um, we are going to hold our fire, fight those European elections, um, and try and deliver a shock. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Nigel you. Farage, uh, the leader of the Brexit party, and a declared candidate for the European Parliament uh, elections. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Cassif uh, asks if I'll be running as an independent. That's still under uh, consideration, Cassif. Fra says the electorate have had enough of the ongoing debacle, re-Brexit. The people want out, not more prevarication, indecision and political duplicity. We want out. That's a very well put together Argument. John says EU powerful pro meat lobby is feeling the pressure of changes to humane diets by helping to ban the term used from veggie burgers to veggie discs, veggie sausages to veggie tubes. Apropos, not very much in the show so far, but welcome nonetheless. John says if we produce, so he goes on, if we produce more of our own food, Britain would be a greener environment to live in. Smaller farms serving the local towns, restricting the money, leaving UK into the hands of food market gamblers, replacing EU policy by paying the workers, not the landowners. Thanks, John. Now I see the relevance. Uh, um, Bob in Bucks says, I draw a line in the sand and I toss my gauntlet in the soil of pro-Brexit mob rule tyranny. And I say, European now, European today, 
European forever. Thanks for that, Bob. And the Communicipalist says, I understand that the government has today written to ask local authorities to prepare polling stations for Euro elections in May. This would be a huge EU error, certain to end 40 years of a centrist majority in Strasbourg, hopefully including you, George. Thank you. And Jackie says, uh, Warrington for Brexit will be marching through Warrington tomorrow determined to have the voices of the 17.4 million heard by our MPs. And the Red Resistance says, I also believe things are changing faster than the politicians can comprehend. Last night on the Andrew Neil programme, I witnessed what's best described as an annihilation of the Conservative Party. How times change. See you at the dance house. Ah, yes, I'm on with Ken Livingston at the dance house in Manchester tomorrow at 7 o'clock. That's Oxford Road, Manchester, The Dance House, me and Ken Livingston, The Outsiders. If you're anywhere near Manchester, I promise you, you won't want to miss it. Ahmed uh, Caballo, thank you for uh, waiting. Uh, Forgive me not being able to give you my uh, whole attention. Uh, Just finally, um, if the US are to fail in this, That would be such a major blow to the prestige of uh, John Bolton, Elliot Abrams, President Trump himself. Uh, It's quite difficult to see them backing off. So are we on a collision course, do you think? Well, the US has not only failed in Venezuela, but they've also failed in Syria, let's not forget. So the precedent has been set. Now, from speaking to government officials... Although, obviously, the problems with sanctions started with the Democratic, um, the, the Obama administration, so it doesn't mean that once Trump, etc., leave, that the problems with the US will stop. But they're very much hoping to make it to 2020, and hopefully a new administration, although it's most likely to still be hostile, it won't be as hostile, because what we've seen... I, I, I beg to differ, I must tell you. Yeah? I mean, as you say, it was Obama that declared war on Venezuela yeah. in the first place. God knows why, whose interests he was serving in that, but he did. And the Democrats in Congress are egging President Trump on to a more and more hawkish uh, attitude towards Venezuela. They are, but they're not egging him on for military intervention. That's the big difference. The Republicans keep telling us all options are on the table, which isn't actually accurate because they don't want to negotiate. So it's not all options on the table. But the Democrats, although they've been hostile, although they're kind of pushing the regime change, they're not going as far. And and, and it's an interesting it's an interesting kind of um, discussion that's been happening for decades. Is it be is it better to be bitten with a wolf with a growl or with a fox with a smile? And and after seeing Donald Trump and and, his, and how he kind of operates and how the liberal media in many ways supports him, I think it's actually be better to be bitten with a, with a, by a fox with a smile, because a fox with a smile wouldn't go so far. The things that Donald Trump's done, just the kind of outlandish approach that he's taken to Venezuela, is nothing that I've seen in 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 my lifetime before. Usually, if there's a coup, you usually wait for the president to be out of the country, or you don't just kind of get a guy to put his hand in the street and say he's the president while the president is sitting in his presidential palace um, fresh off an election victory. It's just, I, I think I think we're, we're entering a dangerous kind of precedent that be, that's been set. And in, in some ways, something needs to change because the collision, the, 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 the trajectory, if it goes in, this, in the direction it's going, it's not going to look too well for, for the people of Venezuela. How do people follow you on social media? It's um, at Ahmed Cabello. Um, Spell you can, that. So A H M E D. Cabello is K A B A L L O. Um, and also, I'm just going to give a few shout outs to a few other organizations that are doing great work. Venezuela Analysis, Grey Zone. There's various people that are giving vital, vital kind of information, dispelling some of the myths about Venezuela, because Venezuela is one of those places where you can literally say anything about and it goes relatively unchallenged. So it's important to not just follow me, but follow people like George and other media outlets that are trying to, trying to kind of address the tidal wave of misinformation. 
Uh, you may have seen my uh, what happened when I just got back from Venezuela. I went straight, literally, from the airport to the Oxford Union. It became quite a celebrated uh, yeah. altercation on the floor when a young boy who'd never been in Venezuela <laughs> yeah. was telling me that the opposition uh, were unable to get on television and so on. When I had just spent uh, 10 days watching the opposition yeah. on television all day and night. So there is a lot of misinformation. And I found your interviews uh, and your packages from out there remarkably good. One of the things that amazed me was how well stocked all the shops were and how many people were shopping in them. Uh, and yet, uh, if you believed other parts of the media, people were going around eating dogs. In fact, on this very station, one of my colleagues uh, did an item that people were eating their pets yeah, in Venezuela. It just uh, goes to show Ahmed Caballo. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk Thank shows. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, here now, uh, this from Graham in Amesbury. Uh, Brexit, we are told, means Brexit. Clearly not, otherwise we would have left last week. We were lied to. Democracy is a malleable concept, apparently, and if any of the major parties want my vote, they can whistle for it. Um, interestingly, I, I didn't ask uh, Nigel Farage this because uh, it's a rival outfit, but there's an outfit called the English Democrats who are in the high court right now, right now, claiming that actually we've already left the European Union on the 29th of March and that Mrs May did not have the legal authority to seek the extension and get the extension to April 12 that she got. And uh, the judge at first uh, base agreed to uh, put this to the court. It is under now active consideration. Well, that'll put the cat amongst the pigeons if it turns out that after all this, we're actually out already. Now, there have been more stabbings in the UK. A man charged for five of them last week. We'll be speaking uh, after the break to a man who knows what it's like down on the street, former police superintendent Leroy Logan, MBE. Let's take a break. This one is from Dana. What can Corbyn do to save himself from the Blairites and implement his own Brexit vision for the country? And Bob Justice says, Tory party's finished. It's an affront to everyday Brits, always has been. Labour party's hot on its heels. Why contest an anti-Corbyn EU candidate? An idiotic move. Corbyn may want change. That party doesn't represent that. Its MPs are full of soft soap. And Muse says, I don't think Corbyn should go into the negotiating room with anyone considered part of the Blairite fifth column. Theresa May would just divide and conquer, offering a deal that they can accept to destroy Labour, but not a deal that Corbyn can support. Now, we've got Leroy Logan, MBE, former police superintendent, on the line. Uh, good evening, Leroy. Thanks for coming back on the show. No problem, George. My first question is this, and it's the same first question I asked you the last time you were on. Is it that we just know more than we used to know, or are people being stabbed all over the place? I think it's a bit of both. Because uh, 10 years ago, we had a, a real spate in knife crime. and um, But at least we had the um, officers to deal with it. Uh, we had 700 more detectives. and 700 uh, more what... detectives in 10 years? We've lost 700 detectives. Uh, and 10,000 10, officers? Well, nationally, it's 20,000. 22,000, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But no, the, the 700 detectives I was speaking about is just in London. We lost 700. Uh, and so we had the capacity to solve these crimes. Uh, and then, you know, we'd, we'd see um, crimes being solved, being put before the court. So we had a high clear up rate of, say, 80%, 90%. Now it's less than half of that. And I suppose on top of it, you've got social media that is in everyone's um, sort of pocket, in their mobile phone, their laptops, you know, iPads, whatever. So the, the 24-hour news is such a high level, plus social media, it gives the impression that there's a lot more crime. 
Um, and I suppose the murder rate would be even higher if it wasn't for these amazing paramedics that stabilise people in situ and those trauma surgeons that turn them around on their operating table. I think that's a good point because uh, the fatalities is alarming enough. But if you got to the uh, numbers of the people actually harmed by knives, it, it, it's it's truly spectacular. I don't have them at my fingertips. Maybe you do. But the, the number of people actually stabbed in London, uh, which is where I live and where I follow the, uh, the crime rates uh, most closely, are, are, are truly staggering. The hospitals, the paramedics are saving people that in another era would definitely be dead. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the number of stabbings has definitely increased about 16, 17 percent, depends on where you look at. And, you know, you're talking tens of thousands of extra um, offences. And, you know, unfortunately, we hear about the the murders, but the life-changing injuries of people who have survived those because of the amazing work of the um, medical um, uh, practitioners and the nursing staff, etc., you know, we don't hear about, and, and they're in their tens and thousands. And that's, that's you know, the, the real, real uh, problem and the crisis I speak about, not just the murders, it's those stabbings because we're not getting those crimes solved. Um, and the acid attack, even up to today, I, I, I've been doing a lot of anti-gang work, and, you know, even people who are not involved in gangs, and I've got one client, who well, unfortunately had acid thrown in his face only two days ago. And, you know, the officers have not come to see him to get a full report of what's happened. And, um, you know, they, they, their lies a big issue because the, the detectives would have been at, at their bedside within hours. He's been discharged and he still hasn't spoken to a detective to find, to find out what exactly has happened. So we've got a real perfect storm of increased crime, less officers to deal with it, and a wall of silence of people not even coming forward with the information. It is extraordinary. Uh, that point you just make there, um, th- there's a problem between the police and some parts of the community, and there's a problem between those parts of that community, those communities, and the police. And that bedevils the need for intelligence, doesn't it? Because if the people feel that the police are them and the police feel that the people are them, then there's a two-way flow of information uh, from both. But if the police are seen as a kind of occupation army, then people don't talk to the police and they don't get the leads and they can't find the criminals and the criminals go on to commit more and more crimes. You're spot on, George. I mean, the um, Keelian principle that started the Met Police in 1829, so Robert Peel said the police are public and public and the police. There's a direct correlation between trust and confidence and information. So if public feel that the police are there for them to protect them, to reassure them that they are safe, then there will be people willing to speak up. But if you can't make them feel safe, they're more than likely they're not going to tell you where the where the, the offences have occurred, who's done what, when and where. And more importantly, they're more prone to be carrying weapons because police are not there for them. And so they fall into that misguided um, principle of, well, listen, street crime, uh, you know, I'll run with people who can make me feel safe and all carry a weapon. Uh, yeah, and regard these gangsters as somehow, uh, you know... Uh, uh, order keepers, people that are uh, running the streets. If you if you think a thug, a criminal, is running the street, you're not going to get on the wrong side of them. Exactly. And, you know, they, they rely on fear and retribution. And, you know, if, if anyone believes they're going to even think about snitching, then, all right, if they can't get you, they will get someone close to you, whether it's family or friends, you know. And, and in fact, just referring to that case only two days ago, the, the person who got the assets thrown in their face was not the actual person they wanted. But because the other person ran off, they thought they'd just throw the assets in that person's face. Oh, my God. Just to say, well, listen, this is just to tell you, just being associated with that person, you're in the firing line. 
Leroy, thanks very much indeed for joining us always. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a pleasure to talk to you because we're always talking about such grim things, but you're a very interesting man. Thanks very much for joining us, Leroy Logan, MBE. Charlie Fe Colross. Hi, gorgeous. Is any Brexit worth breaking up the 300-year-old union? He means, of course, the union uh, between Scotland, England, Wales, etc. And, uh, well, as Charlie, as you're absolutely dedicated to the breakup of that union, I'm not sure uh, why you would ask me that question. Of course, uh, Scotland has the right to be an independent state and in the European Union for whatever independence that's worth. Uh, but you'd have to get a referendum result first. So as I say to you, I think now, rather wearyingly every week, what's keeping you? Why don't you hold another independence referendum? Though, in truth, both of us know the reason for that. The communicipalist says praise is heaped upon Jeremy Corbyn for playing a blinder and maintaining mysterious ambiguity around Brexit. But the reason for Corbynism was Jeremy Corbyn's honesty. This week, according to many letters to my local paper, it's that voters say they have lost faith in. Interesting point. Hazel is on the line in Hampshire. Let's hear from her. Hazel, welcome to the show. Hello there. You're a first-time caller. I am, yes. You're very, very welcome. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Tell me, <laughs> nice what would you like to say? To you. Well, today I received an email from my sister, and it was a chunk of the Lisbon Treaty. Now, we've all heard about this treaty, haven't we? But we've never really been told what's in it. Yeah, you know, I, think the, I, mean, I think famously uh, one of the government ministers, I forget who now, who was putting mm -hmm. it through the house, confessed that he hadn't read it. Oh, for Pete's sake. <laughs> well, well, the bit I read was a bit hair-raising, and I think if the Remainers read it, they'd be heading for the door quicker than the Leavers, because I, I've read the, the chunk I was sent, and in the next two or three years or so, there's all sorts of things going on that yes. the EU want to yes, do. Yes, yes, it's the deepening, and, deepening of union, yeah. Absolutely. It's a total takeover, isn't it? I mean, the Houses of Parliament and all that lot in it, they'll be superfluous. You won't need them if you go by the Lisbon Treaty. But I'm wondering, who on earth signed up for that? Do we know? Well, uh, our government signed up to it, uh, but we had no say in it. Other countries did have a referendum on it. They rejected uh -huh. it. And then, like us, uh, they were forced to think again and keep on thinking till they changed their minds. Oh, so who was in charge in our lot at the time? Uh, it must have been uh, the John Major government. Really? I think so. Well, I thought that, well, I thought... I was that, in so um, long, Hazel, I've, I've forgotten, but my <laughs> friends are checking. Now. But I think it must have well, been John Major. Well, his government was torn to pieces by the Maastricht Treaty as well. Well, so you know, he did, yeah, he did really well, didn't he? <laughs> the Tories have been uh, the Tories have been in trouble uh, over Europe for the entirety of the period from 1973 until now. Labour was well, once right. uh, overwhelmingly Eurosceptic and then became overwhelmingly supportive of the EU. The more mm -hmm. defeats they took in uh, in the Thatcher era, uh, the yeah. more things. Uh, went against uh, Labour and trade unions and so on, the more uh -huh. they fell in love with Mr. Jacques Delors, who, although he's still alive, uh, the ideology that uh, bears his name is long dead. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I voted out the first time round. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm of an age when, <laughs> you know. But, so, I mean, unfortunately, am I, Hazel. Uh, how yeah, do you see I know. it? Uh, what do you think? Uh, are, are we leaving or not? Oh, I hope so. Yeah, but I what do you think? So. What do you think? Um, it looks iffy, doesn't it? Mm. I'm getting quite concerned, actually, that, you know, we'll, we'll be forced into it in some way. They well, the, polls, the, the opinion polls have rapidly changed, faster than I've seen any polls changing. The Sky right. News poll uh, today 
the YouGov poll uh, published early this morning uh, show uh-huh. dramatic shifts in favour of a no-deal Brexit and immediately no more extensions yeah. out without a deal. Uh, and well, I, nev- sure. I never thought... I mean, I'm not against a no-deal Brexit. Uh, I, indeed, there are many things to be said for it. It wouldn't be my number one choice, but it would be no. my number two choice. Um, yeah. um, um, but uh, it seems that public opinion has suddenly tired of the politicians, tired of the wrangling, and said, yeah. let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, let's get out. Well, let's we'll just see. Go. Let's see. <laughs> Don't be a stranger, Hazel. Call me any time. Thanks very All much right, uh, for the uh, for the call. Here's Steve in Great Yarmouth. Go ahead, Steve. Hello, George. Hi. Um, I've uh, been contemplating calling you for quite some years, really, and uh, today I thought, why not? Are you a first-time caller, too? That's great. Two in a row. I am, yeah. Um, I've been listening to you for so long. I've got so many things that I'd like to talk about, so I'll just narrow it down. Um First of all, I feel a bit confused, really, over uh, Jeremy Corbyn and Brexit. I mean, I've been so pleased to see Jeremy, particularly in the 2017 election campaign, the things he had to say really appealed to me and lots of other people like me, I know. And then I've listened to you um, in previous weeks talk about how he doesn't seem to ring true with the Jeremy that you remember. Um and uh, I just feel disappointed that he's not... I feel as though he hasn't stuck to his guns. And I, I still support him if there was a general election tomorrow, without a doubt, but I'm just confused by it all, really. Well, and, uh, I, you have to know the kind of people that are sitting all around him, Steve. Uh, you know, he's in office, but he's not in power in the in in Parliament. Uh, he's He's literally surrounded by hundreds of people that hate him. And even in his shadow cabinet, he's got Tom Watson, Emily Thornberry, Keir Starmer, who are all busily trying to undermine him. I think the thing for me is, though, although I entirely appreciate that, I feel as though if you were in his shoes, you'd have got stuck into them a lot better than he has and not cowed down to them so much and given so much ground. I mean... I can't imagine you in a position where you would be talking about a customs union with Theresa May today. And maybe I'm wrong about that. No, you're correct you, you about that. You know that better than I would. No, you're correct. Saying, uh, you're correct about that. But then my personality, I mean, is very, my personality is very different to his. And it was his personality that got him the 45 nominations or whatever it was to stand for leader and then to win it. You see, uh, the very things that got him those nominations are the things that have weakened his leadership, Uh, being nice to everyone, not having any personal enemies. Uh, these, These were the reasons why he got on the ballot paper in the first place. So, yes, I think I'd have been a stronger leader than Jeremy Corbyn, but I'd never would have become the leader because I wouldn't have got 45 people in the Parliamentary Labour Party to nominate me. Neither would John McDonnell, neither would, uh, neither would Ken Livingston. None of us would have. Sadly, so, so uh, have, you uh, know, it's one of the great paradoxes which <laughs> will haunt us to our graves, uh, that uh, the, the very uh, personality and traits of Jeremy Corbyn that got him on that ballot paper are the very personality and traits that uh, that make him not as effective as he might otherwise be. But uh, we may be moving to uh, a crunch point because let's say, I don't think it's going to happen, but let's say Corbyn did a deal with me. Let's say they reached agreement. Uh, you've then got Emily Thornberry in open, open and public revolt as the shadow foreign secretary. She is demanding that any deal he reaches with Theresa May must be put to a second referendum. As Nigel Farage pointed out earlier, moreover, a referendum between Theresa May uh, deal, the Theresa May-Jeremy Corbyn deal, and remaining in the European Union, even though we've already answered that question. Uh, And uh, that would leave me... What would I vote for? Uh, in such a referendum, uh, Steve. I, I don't support Theresa May's deal or remaining in the European Union. So, what, am I supposed to stay home 
Yeah, uh, my point I, of view is not even I, on the ballot paper. I feel exactly the same. I mean, one of the reasons that I chose tonight to phone after all these years of listening to you was because uh, you'd highlighted Tony Benn. And Tony Benn, since my grandfather first spoke to me about him, has been one of my um, heroes, not just political, but generally heroes around yeah. my life. And yeah. uh, I... Um, I don't think he would, like I said, you wouldn't have got in, into the situation. I don't think he would have done either. But um, Well, I'll, t- I'll tell I you something, Steve. He would Steve. have accepted. No, he wouldn't. If no. a second referendum would have come about, that we would have to have. Uh, for me, I, I don't really know how these things work entirely, but if there is any referendum at all, I would only be happy with it personally if all, uh, maybe not all, but if there were more possibility, no, the, possible outcomes on it, yeah. and no deal... I, I, look, I don't, want them, a second, I, I don't want a second referendum I because either, uh, but... I think it would be extraordinarily divisive, maybe even worse than divisive. I think I it agree, would be, but who knows it, it would be a gigantic uh, paralysis in the country. But if we were going to have another referendum, Steve, it, the only legitimate questions would be, do you support Theresa May's deal or do you want to leave on WTO terms? I, I agree with that. That, that. that at least has some democratic legitimacy. To because ask the, for the, people the to vote on whether to remain there, again is an affront to democracy and a very dangerous one. I agree. I agree entirely. I mean, unless there's something in... If there, if there is a second vote, which I wouldn't support, unless there's something in it that accepts the outcome of the, uh, of first, the first referendum, referendum yeah. then it's, then it's, then it's, it's uh, a, democratically it's an, it's a disaster, and, it, yeah. and it's, a, it's an absolute two fingers up to our democracy. I agree, so Steve. Uh, don't be a stranger. Uh, call again, uh, because you're very eloquent. I need to press on, uh, unfortunately. John is in Thirsk in North Yorkshire. John, welcome. Hi, George. Hi. Um, perhaps you'll be able to help me. I'm absolutely confused around the whole EU question. Normally, I'm not a confused person. Normally, I have very strong political commitments. But on the EU, I abstained initially because I didn't like the binary vote. Uh Although, at the same time, my whole political background pushed me in a Benite leftist position, so I should have voted out. Um, And I knew exactly what people were voting for because we got a bloody leaflet, didn't we? Yes, everyone, cost, every, it cost you nine million quid. Yeah, everyone got a leaflet. So everyone knew exactly what they were voting for. Um, and I'm assuming if everybody could read, they knew what was going down. And so people voted to leave. But at the same time, it was a close vote. Not that close. A million and a quarter... 1.4 million was the majority... But a national, right, it's a referendum, George, you know. Yeah, but, st- you know, 1.4 million is a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, I accept that. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not disputing that. Yeah. If, uh, just put it this way, John, if it had gone the other way, there would be nobody on the winning side then saying, that was a bit too narrow. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be saying, how can we renegotiate, you know, or anything like exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. I mean, part they, of- they won it during the week with one vote of a majority. Uh, uh, and that one vote was a convicted uh, yeah. prisoner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my my big problem with the whole EU question is not that I'm not in favour of what you're saying in that sense, because I think the, the things I want could only come from, from, from a, um, a Brexit and, a, and then to a degree a hard Brexit. But, you know, a, a, a lot of you guys who want to leave, you, you seem to think we're going to go back to some kind of 19th century trading agreements here, there and everywhere. And those people who want to remain think that they can kind of have the snuggly, cuddly Europe as if nothing's going to impact on Europe. And my big point is the environmental impacts. And, and, and we know this is kind of going to come. And, and the U.S., um, did a report on this, I think, about six months ago, maybe nine months ago, where huge amounts of the U.S. are not going to be able to produce food, their ports could possibly be damaged by climate change, um, the whole of the, of the southern European lateral, which is the Mediterranean, etc., is going to be massively hit by climate change. It's just like as if both sides don't take into account what's going to be coming down the pipe. 
No, there's no reason at all for that. If we elected a government uh, that w- uh, I said in my very first broadcast after the referendum in 2016, we should send an email to the European Union. We should tell them that we would at least match every one of their standards, environmental standards, uh, um, food Uh, standards, labor standards, uh, women's rights standards, every standard, we would at least match, if not better, the standards that would be followed in the European Union. Now, of course, there are only a certain kind of government that would make that commitment. But if the people in Britain voted for that government making those commitments, as I believe that they would, then we would be a beacon to the world on these matters, not and some it, kind of 90th century throwback. And let's face it, we brought some of these things in far earlier. Far than, earlier than the EU yeah, did. Yeah. I've got to press on, John, thanks as always, you because I've got on. the visiting professor from Boreham Wood, the legend, Lisa. Welcome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I've never been introduced as that before, George. Thank you very, very much. I've, I, I've given you an honorary professorship in the oh. Open University of the Airwaves because well, you're so eloquent so, and because I'm feeling so happy because Mo Salah just scored a goal for Liverpool, putting them 2-1 up. Anyway, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, excellent. Oh, oh, that's a brilliant result for Liverpool then. Yep. George, uh, yes, that professorship actually would count far more to me than from anywhere else because Thank I really you. don't rate those other places. They uh-huh. are... Um, uh, well, I don't think all they cracked up to be. Okay, so I'll, I'll just crack on with my points. Go on, What's Professor. Really worrying me is the amount of people you see on social media and on the news talking about not voting or spoiling their vote. I think this is a trap. You don't hear Remainers calling up saying that they're going to be spoiling their vote or no, not voting. No, no, I did deal with that last week, but it's good that you have returned to it. Yes, the, and the, the power in the country would be perfectly delighted if people never bothered to vote again. I know. You you don't see after an election the politician who won come out and lamenting the fact that so many people, so many millions spoiled their vote. People aren't thinking it through. So I know your audience is extremely intelligent and well-informed, but I think it's up to us all to emphasize to people that if we do vote in the EU elections, they are proportional representation. Therefore, every vote counts. Therefore, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to make a difference. I just think it's faulty reasoning, and people actually need to go and think it through before they do such a ridiculous Yes, no, you're absolutely correct. And the uh, it may be the shortest parliamentary term in history. And uh, personally, if I'm elected, I hope it is. Uh, I hope to be in the European Parliament for the the shortest term possible, because I my my entire program consists of a demand that the decision of the British people in 2016 be fully honoured. Yes. George, it only comes up on your show, and there are a couple of callers that have mentioned it. And uh, please clarify this for me, because I am stunned that it's never mentioned elsewhere. Um, I believe that because of um, the various EU laws, and I believe that this would continue under her deal, or if we were in the single market, the things like the state aid law, the 3% spending limit, and the competition laws would prevent Jeremy Corbyn from enacting many of the promises within his manifesto, particularly the promises that were attractive to a large amount of people. Why is this never mentioned in the mainstream? Well, uh, yes, uh, partly because it is uh, untruthfully denied uh, Mm. by supporters of the EU. Uh, I have uh, close relations with the RMT, the Railway Workers Union, and they're forever actually publishing in black and white Mm. on social media the very rules and laws of the EU which would make it impossible for Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell mm-hmm. to run the kind of economy that they are pledged to run. For example, on public ownership of railways. Mm-hmm. It is now extremely difficult and will shortly, under the Lisbon Treaty, be illegal to bring your railways into public ownership because all goods and services must be offered across the European Union in a competitive tendering process. 
It's there in black and white, but people don't want to read details and facts, Lisa. Well, well, I think it's more than a detail. It's fundamental. And I see a lot of the Blairites, they come on paper reviews, and on one hand they're telling you, you know, how supportive they are of Corbyn's policies and how wonderful they are, and then they're telling you how much we should be in the EU. And I think, how can you maintain such contradictory opinions at the same time? But uh, just to say on the second referendum, um, yes, it would be devastating to have to choose between Theresa May's deal and remain. But the debate, I think, in a second referendum, if we had a different choice to that, would be extremely interesting because of all the developments that have taken place. For example, the PESCO and the fast-moving development of the EU army or Francesca Mogherini acting like an EU foreign minister. Everything that's coming out, we would have so much more ammunition. And I think they would be diminished because we've already seen that their fear campaign was based on on smoke and mirrors. Yes, so I, I do be- think, Professor, that the uh, the reason why the there's been this rapid change in the last week, two weeks, is that people have looked more closely into the face of the European Union mm-hmm. uh, as we have been involved in this wrangle with them. Absolutely. I think it's been the most valuable debate that's gone on in our society and across Europe. I think um, Nigel Farage said on the morning of the 24th, we kicked the first brick out the out the wall. That indeed we did. We've set something in motion and we've certainly inspired a lot of the European Eurosceptics and, and also we've just inspired debate across Europe. I just wish that a few Remainers would stop being glued to the BBC and following and believing everything they see on there, open their minds and look across the board, across the channel at what's happening with a with a more open mind. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa, in Boreham Wood. Now, don't forget me and Ken Livingston are on tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, 7.30 it might be, make it 7 o'clock, at the Dance House in Oxford Road. There are still a few tickets left. You can get them. I think 10 have gone in the course of this show. Uh, so there are still seats left, but don't delay. You can get them online at the Dance House, Oxford Road, Manchester. Me and Red Ken, the outsiders, talking about Brexit, talking about uh, the potential general election, European elections, the world situation, uh, and, of course, history, 100 years of membership of the Labour movement between us. I know we don't look it. And neither does the next visiting professor, the legend, Norma. (laughs) In Bristol. <laughs> Go ahead, Norma. Oh, George, I am feeling my age a bit and my health is deteriorating. Uh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I it's... know you're going to stay with us. Oh, gosh, yeah, I'm keeping up to date with what's going on. However, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to slightly change. I'm not going to talk about Brexit. I wanted to talk about Danny Rose, this um, black footballer. For oh, not yes, to... yes, a very fine yeah. player, too, yeah. Well, he doesn't. He says he to... can't wait for his career to end. I know because of the racism in the sport. But you know, where would we be if we didn't have these talented guys? And where would I... the England team be? Where would the oh, English yeah. Premiership be if it weren't for black footballers? Absolutely. But you know, I've observed because I watch the football, and they're three-one up now, main Liverpool. Um, I've observed that if you look at the crowds and the, the supporters. You don't see very many black faces, and I think it's a bit odd. Um, and I wonder why, because having such you know great well, uh, you know, Britain's you know. an eighty-seven percent white country, um, yeah, so you, you, you would expect to see at most thirteen uh, percent non-whites uh, in the crowds. And I know lots of clubs where that's easily met. That uh, do you? That figure. Yeah. I mean, I just watched the big and Bristol, but the big games, and um, my, I do go across and I think, gosh, I haven't even seen one black supporter. And I just think it's an observation mm. that I've, um, I keep looking sometimes to see. Well, um, I'm, I must say that racism in football today is nothing like as bad as it was. No. When the first black players came on the scene, I was already an avid uh, goer to football games, and it was absolutely routine. It was the awful. filthiest, vile, racist abuse, incessant, 90 minutes, and by significant numbers of people. Now, we've still got it today, of course. Some clubs are worse than others, uh, but because almost every team 
has so many black players in their team, mm. uh, the absolute absurdity of racism uh, gets through even the thickest of skulls. Now, that's not to say that incidents, when they happen, uh, are uh, trivial. They're very really, far right? from trivial. The uh, Raheem Sterling, for example, the abuse that he gets, uh, uh, not just on uh, 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 international duty, as he did the other day, but yeah. also uh, in uh, some sections of the media and so on, uh, I think is disgraceful. It's horrendous. Uh, I hate it. Danny Rose uh, is one of Danny my favorite Rose. one of my favorite footballers, actually. Mm. And uh, when I heard him say today yeah. that he can't wait for his career to end, my it's... heart literally sank. Yeah, and me, but they must have stronger measures. I don't quite know how, but they must. That's what he was saying, really. Yeah. Well, the the, it, I mean, of course, you've got to get into the head and into the heart of the miscreant, ultimately. But while you're trying to do that, you have to punish the club. Because if you punish the club, and I don't mean financially, that's meaningless. Mm. You've got to take points off people. You've got to put people, kick them out of competitions. Yeah. And then all the other supporters will ensure that yeah. they like maniacs it. that are amongst them are not shouting racist abuse against uh, black footballers. Norma, everyone sends their best wishes uh, <laughs> from the show, but also all the listeners will be very happy to hear you back in uh, half-decent fettle, at least. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Mohammed is in Maidenhead. Always worth hearing. Mohammed, go ahead, sir. Good evening, George. You've caught me right in the middle of the Liverpool term. Well, I'm so happy for my boy. My middle son is a Liverpool fanatic. He loves Mo Salah. Mo Salah scored a great goal. I'm so happy I'm going home to him now, and I just know the joy unconfined that he'll be oh. feeling. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it makes the hair stand. The goal was amazing. Your son's going to be really proud. It was an amazing, amazing goal. It's 3-1 now. Henderson put one away as well. He so. did. He scored it well. It was a great cross from Firmino. Yeah, it was. It Mohammed, was you should go and see John Motson on Monday. I'll tell you, you'll enjoy that. Really? Well, I might, yeah, well, I'll look into it, George. It's I'll a talk it. sport uh, presentation, uh, and it's at the Greenwood Theatre, and uh, yeah. and John Watson is an amazing guy, and uh, Hawksby, Paul Hawksby, who will be presenting it for us, he's a brilliant, brilliant broadcaster and a, a man that knows everything there is to know, not just about broadcasting, but about football too. I'd love to go, George. If I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll look up the... Have a look at it, yeah. Yeah, I look up. I'll do my best to get there, George. Um, uh, so, well, tonight I was looking to have um, a bit of a challenge with you, George, because, uh, you know, I'm not an expert at Brexit. It's going to be a bit of a schoolboy versus the world champion here, but I'm going to do my best to try and challenge you. Um, and I'm going to begin by saying that I don't believe it's a betrayal for a second referendum purely because 28% of the public didn't vote, who are eligible to vote. They didn't vote. Now, we all know that. Well, we don't all know, but I know that. Action without knowledge is vanity. And a lot of what we've been told about Brexit has been false information. It's a bit like the PPI scandal. You know, with PPI, you know, people are getting compensated because they got given wrong information. Uh, Brexit is going to be very similar because there are so many disadvantages to Brexit. I can list them to you. And I'm not for or remain. I'm just in favour yeah. of a... Mohammed, uh, because of the hour, I need to stop you because I have one more call I need to get in. And I promise you I will return to these uh, issues. But frankly, more people voted in this referendum than have ever voted in any ballot in our country in all of our history. So the number of people who didn't vote uh, uniquely doesn't count a jot because it was the biggest ever turnout in British electoral history. And if governments only got to govern because they told the whole unvarnished truth in their election campaigns, we would never have a government. I promise you I'll come back to it. I need to hear from Martin in Newington. Go ahead, Martin. Hello, uh, George. Thanks very much. Uh, you, there's so much, so so much uh, substance in in, in the programme, but I, I thought uh, I, I will connect them. One, Tony Benn. I was fortunate to hear him speak uh, not too long before he he died. And two, 
When I first called you, I spoke of, of um, nature abhorring a vacuum and that one of the problems of, with Corbyn was that he didn't establish clearly his, uh, should we say, a protégé, his being a protégé of, of Tony Benn. But interestingly, a lot of uh, Tory people tend to, tend to believe that, that they're the ones who were fighting against Europe. Well, it was Clement Attlee in the 1950s. Yes, uh, again, uh, again, Martin, we will have to return to this, but it was Clement Attlee, it was Hugh Gateskill, it was Harold Wilson, it was Jim Callaghan, it was Michael Foote, it was Peter Shaw, Barbara Castle, Tony Benn, above all, who opposed the European Union. My apologies to all those that didn't get through or get their message read out. Stay tuned on Talk Radio for my good friend Flippin' Kath, who's up and holding the fort herself, and the show will be no poorer for it. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you.